Hey yo, and what is up, gang? Thank you for checking out Sledgehammer TV tonight. If you are a D AEW fan and you are already all in with All Elite Pro Wrestling, then it is guaranteed that you enjoyed the shit out of Fighter Fest last night. If you're a WWE fan and maybe you hate everything about AEW, then I guarantee you you tore this show a new a hole. As I've seen all over social media, so many WWE diehards just trashing this show. But then, then there are wrestling fans like myself and like many of you who follow me here with no allegiance to anything but the sport of professional wrestling itself. With that being said, Fighter Fest was a very good show, but was there things wrong with this show? Absolutely. And those of us who fall right in the middle see with clear, open eyes. And not everything was great about Fighter Fest. And I am going to tell you guys everything wrong with this show while simultaneously telling you all the great things about what came out of Fighter Fest. My name is Nick Nightmare, and this is the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show's AEW Fighter Fest review. Let's do it. Alright wrestling fans, thank you so much for joining me. This one's going out. This one's going out to all you Dolph Ziggler crybabies out there who like to attack my channel every Monday and Tuesday when I bring the hammer down on Raw and SmackDown and tell me, Oh, you're just an AEW cocksucker. You just go watch your vanilla midgets and your indie jerk-offs and blah 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 with your t-shirt company and all this nonsense. This one is especially... For every one of you. So take all those comments that you left me and shove them right up your ass. Because the hammer is coming down on AEW. I am not like everybody else you are looking at that is just having a fucking field day. Talking about, oh, this was such a great show. AEW is the future. AEW is going to stay wrestling. Blah, 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 blah. That very well may be the case. But take it fucking easy. This is their second show. And for their second show... It was a decent effort. We had a lot of great wrestling. We had some very athletic contests. And there was that's the one thing we can't ask anything more, right? We got some great wrestling, right? But you have to look between the lines. This is a company that is going to be forming a television show. They are going to be giving us storylines. And these are some of the things that they are giving us. And one of the things that they are giving us is hardcore matches. And... The biggest match of the night, you can you have to say, is the John Moxley versus Joey Janela lights out unsanctioned match for what fucking reason? Here's where the hammer comes down. I don't want to to piss you guys off, and you know if you don't like what I have to say, then I, then I apologize. But I speak the truth on this channel. It don't matter what fucking three letters come in front of your company's name. All right. What reason is John Moxley fighting Joey Janela? Last time I saw Joey Janela, I thought he was dead when he went through that table in the all-in uh, the battle royal at the last one, double or nothing, the battle royal. I thought he was legit dead, and now he's here fighting John Moxley in a hardcore match for what? Why are we having this? This match meant nothing to me. All this was was the debut match of John Moxley. And I learned a couple of things from the debut match of John Moxley. I learned that I don't really know what the definition of lights out means. Because to me, when you say lights out, that means that the fucking lights are out. And that these two guys were going to essentially be wrestling in the dark. Well, I understand you can't do that on a television show and nobody can fucking see anything. I don't understand the terminology. And it was very weird that they would use that to describe this matchup. And why they didn't just call it an unsanctioned hardcore match. Why the hell we had to mention the lights going out just because they had to turn on and off the lights before to officially signal the end of the show? Like, I, I, I don't get it. Now, I appreciate them trying to make sense of things. But I don't get it. I don't get it. And I also learned that I don't need hardcore wrestling in my life anymore. And I actually, more than I'm thinking about it, I don't think I ever really enjoyed 
the extremely hardcore stuff, like the barbed wire stuff and like all the shit we used to see back in the day. Essentially, that's what this match was. This match was a love letter to 90s extreme wrestling. And maybe some things that happened back then should be left back then. Especially when there is no rhyme or reason for this match to be happening. Is this what John Moxley was pushing so hard to be like in the WWE? If that was the case, then you probably can't blame Vince McMahon to rein this guy in. Somebody's got to pull this guy back a little bit. This was your first foray into the, your new company, your first big matchup. And instead of coming out there and showing us wrestling how much of a great wrestler you are, how you were so underused and underappreciated, you want to come out there and try to kill yourself. Why? Hardcore wrestling has its time and its place, and that is usually in specific situations. A hardcore match without a division or some sort that you can put the parameters in for the matchup even taking place should really only be used to end or accentuate an ongoing rivalry. A rivalry that has some meaning behind it and has been a, a long-standing feud that the fans want to see resolved. A hardcore matchup is a great matchup to throw a hiccup in there before you get into like a steel cage and some of the more intense matchups to tr finally bring this rivalry down to an end. Both of these guys not being able to get over one another. Like, you need to build up a hardcore match. Just having two crazy guys go out there who essentially have a death wish, giving us a light version of a death match... On an AEW wrestling show. Oh, but it's unsanctioned. It's not AEW. Stop it. Stop it. That's all bullshit. Unsanctioned. If it was unsanctioned, it wouldn't be happening. Okay, it was just... I don't understand it. I don't understand what the point of this whole thing was. If you like this kind of thing, then you had a great time. And you probably loved it. If you're not a hardcore wrestling fan, you probably watched and felt very similar to me. I can take it or leave it. If it's done properly and put in the, rock, uh, in the right context, then I can enjoy a hardcore matchup, even if they get a little bit too extreme for my particular liking. But what I saw last night was not wrestling. There was no feeling in this match. There was no drama. There was no reason for it. And that's my stance on the John Moxley matchup with Joey Janela. You want to go into something even more unnecessary. The most unnecessary thing to happen at this entire show was the unprotected headshot to Cody Rhodes by Sean Spears. While I enjoy the turning of Sean Spears, I do not mind the use of a steel chair in professional wrestling. There is not one reason that you could give to me in the entire world. It doesn't matter what Sequence of words you try to put together in any kind of sentence. There is no defense for having that unprotected headshot. Nothing would have suffered by Sean Spears hitting Cody Rhodes in the back with the steel chair. It would have still had the same impact. We wouldn't have had Cody Rhodes get his friggin' lights knocked out. And we wouldn't have had the accidental blood. Now, I don't know whether or not it was accidental. I don't know if this is exactly what they planned, if somehow they they made it intentionally happen. But when I go back and I watch that headshot, which I did repeatedly, it was an accident. It was an accident. Sean Spears hit him flush with the chair right in the center of the cranium where he's supposed to. But the momentum and the force that he used caused the edge of the backrest on the chair to dig into Cody's skull. And with that much momentum, it's going to cause a laceration. And now we had this situation happen, and we had the announce team fumbling all over themselves, and all of this to to do what exactly? I understand we're trying to push Sean Spears now. He's going to be a heel. He turned on his best friend, Cody Rhodes, and that was great. But if that was the direction for Cody Rhodes, then what are we doing with Darby Allen? Darby Allen, my God. You want to talk about something fantastic about this night? That kid is is unbelievable. I don't know where he comes from. I don't know how I've never seen nor heard of him before, but that you want to talk about one of the great things. I loved everything about Darby Allen in his match with Cody Rhodes. So when they go 20 minutes, they go a full 20 minutes and the time limit expires, which is a lost art in the world of professional wrestling to use 
to get your feuds over. Once that time limit expires, you're automatically assuming we're going to have these two go at it again, and it's going to be fucking great because what we just saw between them was fantastic. Darby Allen with the I will not die attitude and Cody Rhodes doing everything he possibly could to defeat this kid, and it just didn't, it just, it just couldn't manifest for Darby Allen on this night. But then you have Sean Spears come out and take the spotlight and, and move it off of this kid and onto him. And I'm and I'm wondering, what are we doing three ways with with this? Like, I was now very interested in the story you were about to tell with this new kid, this new face. And now, while I appreciate the push for Sean Spears, I don't think now maybe was the time to do that. Or maybe some, you know, at the next show, you could have did something like that. It just, to me, I don't understand. I... I I don't want to say I don't understand, because I understand they're going in this direction with Sean Spears and Cody Rhodes. They're going to do this program. But I feel like by doing that, they just built a little bit of momentum with this other Cody Rhodes, Darby Allen thing, and it could have been great. But I have a feeling they're just going to, to move it over to to Sean Spears instead, which which isn't a bad thing, because, you know, Darby Allen's just getting started here. Everybody's just getting started here, and they're just trying to work out the kinks and... Maybe they didn't think that all the way through. Like, well, what happens to this kid after Cody gets wrapped in the head? And why he had to get wrapped in the head, I will never know. It was unnecessary. There's a reason why we don't really do those type of things anymore. And even that particular spot, the chair shot to the head, there's no reason for it anymore. It's overbooking it, really. And if it was... If it was Cody's idea, which I'm sure it was, then, you know, fine. I understand where you were trying to go. But there was a better way to go about that. There is no excuse for me for a shot like that. And I think it, it just took everybody completely out of whatever fun you were having at that moment. Th- this was now like a serious situation. You got JR talking about concussion testing. In the aftermath, Cody Rhodes is okay. There were no signs of a concussion. He had to get 12 stitches in his head to to fix the cut. And we're going to move on. How we're going to move on, I don't know. I just hope that uh, Darby Allen gets a little gets a little bit of a push coming out of this and doesn't get pushed aside for, for Sean Spears. And it's nothing against the guy. I'm sure he didn't purposely do what he did. And I'm looking forward to what they're going to do with this in the future. But... You know, it is what it is. What are you going to do? I, I didn't really appreciate it all that much. Another thing you guys are probably going to be thinking you're, I'm absolutely nuts about is that six-man tag team matchup. The one that was the main event of the main show before the unsanctioned nonsense that happened at the very end. Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks taking on the Lucha Brothers and El Laredo and what we watched was a matchup of fantastic talent and athletic contests that you will never see the likes of on a Monday or a Tuesday night. And at points, it was absolutely breathtaking. It was jaw-dropping. And it was an incredible, incredible matchup. It was a great match for all these guys to showcase exactly what they can do. My problem with it is what they can do. <laughs> now, this may sound crazy to you guys. But I feel like this match went on just a little bit too long, which resulted in it actually starting to feel like a spot fest. It's like we were watching a highlight reel. Every single thing that was happening was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And like I said with the hardcore thing, when you just keep elevating it to that next level, next level, next level, every time you see it, it gets less and less special. And when you choreograph your matchup to have multiple repetitive spots. How many times can one person withstand a super kick? How many super kicks can we see in one match? I'm sure this is a world record that this trio or this uh, six man round robin of competitors is actually going for. It's the same kind of complaints that I have with New Japan. It's just, I'm not a big fan of the no sell offensive sequences. How can you get hit with a Canadian Destroyer and then get up and follow it up with a clothesline? That just is fucking ridiculous to me. Kenny Omega. Everybody's all high on Kenny Omega. i not that high on Kenny Omega. I feel like he's a poor man's Chris Jericho whose offensive set list is 60% V-triggers, 20% 
failed one-winged angels, and then 20, 30, however many left remaining percent everything else. I, I don't see what's really that special. I'm not trying to take away from what they accomplished. Like I said, it was a great matchup. It entertained me. But then, I get bored in between. Because it's just, see, oh, okay, V-Trigger, again. Another Canadian Destroyer, again. Another springboard cutter of some sort. Another Spanish fly. Like, the first time they did all these things, I was like, whoa, yeah, this is a fucking great match. And then it was like we hit the repeat button on all the same segments that we already seen. That is my criticism of nearly every Young Bucks, you know, Kenny Omega matchup, every New Japan matchup. It's all just a lot of repetitive spots and that no-sell offense bullshit just does not play well with me. How do you get kicked in your face at that velocity and not drop and be down for a while? You guys do understand that this was the move that Shawn Michaels, probably the greatest wrestler of all time, used to finish a Hall of Fame roster of professional wrestlers. And now it has just gone the wayside of just your average fucking move, just like Jake Roberts' DDT. Back in the day, the DDT, you got hit with it, it was over. Now the DDT has been improved upon, it's got 90,000 variations, and it's being hit 500 times in one matchup. So what real impact do any of these moves have? If they can be hit, and the guy can just pop up, no, your Canadian Destroyer didn't hurt me, your V-Trigger kicked me in the face, but now I'm gonna fucking elbow you. That's why that all those matches with Omega and Okada, like, yeah, they're good. They're really good, but if you really, really watch them and you really open your eyes and you take your fucking fandom and you shove it down here and you look with an unobjective opinion, or an objective opinion rather, you see what I see. And it's just repeat in the same match. We're on SmackDown, we talk about rinse and repeat the same show and rinse and repeat the same segments. These guys rinse and repeat the same moves multiple times in one match. And then you're going to have all these fanboys, oh no, it was a great... (laughs) Yeah, it was great the first time. Not a big fan of the overly acrobatic, flippy stuff. I do appreciate it. And it is great and entertaining. But when you keep doing it, why do it in the first place if it's not going to fucking work? It's one of my biggest things, man. Why hit the V-trigger knee if it's not going to incapacitate him and be done? That's supposed to be your finish. You go for it at the finish when you know he's not going to get up. You hit the V-trigger and then you follow it up with the one-winged angel and the match is over. But how many times did we see a V-trigger last night? That's just me. That's just me. And then if you want to just compound that with... The fact that this matchup started out as a traditional six-man tag, and then for some unexplained, unknown reason, it just became a six-man tornado of chaos. It was very, very messy at at points, you know, very chaotic, but very impressive what these guys... Don't don't get me wrong. I'm giving criticism. That is what a fucking critic does. I'm not going to sit here and just, Oh, oh, the Young Bucks, they know how to do it. Look at all the kicks. No, man. I'm, if nothing, you guys know I am fair. And I come down just as hard on them as anybody else. And while, like I said, that was a great matchup, me, my opinion, personally, those are the things that I feel were wrong with this show. And we are going to just go into the results of this show right now with my final real big complaint. Hopefully I don't go off into any other tirades, but... Since we're going to talk about the start of this show, we had a triple threat tag team matchup that was put on the buy-in free show. Now, I don't understand the point of that because Fighter Fest was free for all of us. You went to Bleacher Report, you streamed it free, you watched it live. So you're not trying to get anybody to buy the show. Why put such a big match, something that actually has something at stake to it as well, on the free part of the show, 
if you if I'm booking the show, that matchup is going to easily be flip flopped with that Seema versus Daniels match that started off this show. If you would have kicked off this show with that triple threat match, you <laughs> that would really to me was the way to kick it off. But that is my final complaint. I hope for this whole entire thing because this show started off. With the best friends defeating SoCal Uncensored and my friends from House of Glory Professional Wrestling Private Party making their AEW debut in tremendous fashion. These guys won over the crowd because they are fantastic. They, I knew exactly what AEW was getting because I've seen them doing this kind of stuff for the last two years in House of Glory. And I was never more proud than I was to watch my guys from my school that I'm going to right now out there tearing it up and stealing the show. Maybe more than anybody else the entire night on the whole entire card. And it was just a fantastic thing to see. Which is another reason why I feel it should have been the start of the show and it could have definitely flip-flopped with the show they the match they chose to open the show with. And especially with the winners getting the bye. They are getting a bye in the tag team title tournament at All Out. That's high stakes. That's something that should have been on Fighter Fest, not on a free pre-show. So they're making the same type of mistakes that the WWE makes. It, nobody is perfect. Everybody lets us look at it for what it is and see with your eyes wide open. Don't just be blinded by the AEW logo. Look at it as a show, and if if you feel like you're okay with all of this, then great, but I'm here to educate you otherwise, and to hope to clear your vision, just in case you get a little bit lost in all of this stuff, but this was a fantastic matchup, so many great spots, the finish had Trent pinning my friend Isaiah Cassidy, and one more time, I'm going to put this out there, Mark Quinn of Private Party, was the first person to ever strike me in a professional wrestling ring. We were cutting promos against one another, and I got so hot under his collar with what I said that this guy, even though he wasn't supposed to kick me, and there was supposed to be no physical contact, what I said got him to super kick me right in the face. It was the first time, and it was fucking amazing. It was awesome, and I will get him back for it one day. I hope, if he ever comes back to House of Glory, which he will be doing, to fight the Young Bucks at the next House of Glory event in August. Cheap plug right there. But let's move on with this review. Leva Bates, the librarian girl, versus Ali. I could have lived without this matchup. This, this whole librarian thing, the male and the female, it reeks to me of WWE bullshit. Like, this is the type of stuff that you would put on WWE TV and I would come swinging away. Fucking librarian. Come on. I, I, I'm I not into it. All the shh, shh, shh. I don't get the point. Until we get to the real show and I see what these two knuckleheads are all about, I don't give a shit. I really, really don't. This was a, a just a takeaway match. It didn't really matter. It was very rough to watch at times, and it was something you could definitely skip as Allie beats Leva Bates, the librarian female. And then we get Michael Nakazawa beating Alex Jabeli in a hardcore match. You want to call this a hardcore match? I want to call this a ridiculous ridiculous encounter. There was no reason for this to, to even happen. Here we go, complaining again. I, I pr promised you guys I wasn't going to complain, but I forget about things, and then I bring up this fucking hardcore match, which was ridiculous. But again, if this was your type of thing and you enjoyed it, you know, good for you. This is not the type of stuff that I want to sit down and ingest when I'm trying to watch pro wrestling. These guys walking around on stupid studs and, and doing all kinds of crazy shit that definitely didn't need to happen. This was a match that could have just been scrapped from the card completely. Why have a hardcore match on the pre-show and then finish the show and have it main event be the same thing? I, I, I. Let's move along. 
we go to the main show. Shima pins Christopher Daniels in what comes out to your pretty standard matchup. A lot of back and forth. I uh, love Christopher Daniels. I was always a huge fan of him. The first time I laid eyes on him when I seen him in TNA, I thought this guy was something special. And all these years later, he's proven to be just that. He's a big part of SoCal Uncensored. I really, really enjoy his whole entire character, his portrayal, how he came out with the microphone like a rock star, screaming out the SCU. Like, he, he is pro wrestling. But this was a match he didn't need to be having. I don't know Shima... I'm not familiar with him. That doesn't mean that he shouldn't be there. But this was a pre-show matchup. You want to talk about a pre-show matchup? This was one. You could have put Christopher Daniels on a pre-show? No, I wouldn't. But if this was the type of opponent you're going to give for him, then fine. Doesn't need to be on the main show. That's for sure. It was a decent matchup between the two. And Sima gets the win here for whatever reason. I'm sure this is a story we will be going forward with as as we go down this AEW road. I don't know who these OWE wrestlers are. I don't know if I should care enough to get to know them. We will let time decide. We had a very good triple threat women's matchup. Here's where I really did enjoy myself. Well, again, much like in the case with Shima, I don't know Riho, Raiho, I don't even know how to say it. I don't know Yuka Sakazaki and I am only familiar with Nyla Rose from the from with any of these females from the last AEW event. But this triple threat match was one of my favorite matches of the night. They told the perfect story. Two much smaller, much more agile females versus one beastly woman. And the spots that were in this matchup were called perfectly. Nyla Rose looked like an unstoppable beast. And if not for the very last second maneuvering of Yuka Sakazaki. <laughs> she would have won this matchup with ease. Yuka scoops her up. Not scoops her up, I'm sorry. Nyla scoops up Yuko. I'm sorry, Riho. See, I can't even get these names. I get it all mixed up even on the paper. The finish saw Nyla Rose get a beast bomb on Rio, but Rio rolled through and then would suddenly get the pin for a surprising three count on the monster. And then we would have Yuka make the save as Rio was going to get her ass beat even more by Nyla Rose following the match. But then Rio would shove down Yuka like, no thanks, babe. And then walk away. I really did enjoy that matchup. I thought it was very good. I enjoyed this next matchup as well. Hangman Page defeated MJF Jungle Boy with Luchasaurus, which is a fantastic pairing. I think that's a great pairing, and I want to see them as a tag team immediately. I think that's going to be great. And also Jimmy Havoc, who has become one of my new favorite guys. He's a little bit to the extreme. I don't really care for the staples like we've talked about already. I can do without the staple gun and all that nonsense, but I love his look and his in-ring style and his presence, and Jimmy Havoc is all right with me. But you know who's even more all right with me is Maxwell Jacob Friedman. If Paul Heyman was a professional wrestler, he would be MJF. And he would be fucking awesome. This guy, when you give him a microphone, just absolutely floors you. He tears the whole entire show in two. In a good way. It's just like, this guy is next level. He doesn't even... He is above and beyond everybody else that's on this roster. His in-ring ability is fantastic. His microphone skills are not to be touched, man. He got the crowd super hot on him because he said this was a video game convention we were at, and so it's all based around video games. Everybody there is a big video game person, and he goes out and says he used to love video games too, but then he lost his virginity, and the crowd lost their mind. He said something to some guy about their mother, which escapes me from from this moment, but it just just was some next-level stuff. MJF is fucking great. And this matchup was very good. It started off a little slow, if I'm really being honest, but it picked up in a big way. Jungle Boy really impressed me in this outing. He took a hell of a beating. MJF is my favorite, favorite character, I think, in all of All Elite Professional Wrestling, and it was fucking great. 
I really did enjoy it. I was hoping that MJF would win because I am much more invested in seeing him move on than having Hangman Page move on. Not that he was going to lose his shot at Chris Jericho, but like if you want to, you want to put somebody at the head of this company to to lead it into the charge. If you want to do this war with WWE, you got nobody better than MJF. Let me tell you that. Cody versus Darby Allen. Like we have already discussed this, I enjoyed this matchup fully. And the time limit draw is just something that is absolutely missing. Time limits can be used in such a fantastic way. And this is one of those ways. You have a talent in there like Cody Rhodes. You have another guy that's coming up like Darby Allen. And you don't want either one of them to suffer a pinfall tonight, as both of them are probably going to lead on to something else. And this is the way you do it. It doesn't have to be a double count out. It doesn't have to be a double disqualification. It doesn't have to be any kind of shenanigans. It could be as simple as these guys just going out there and wrestling each other for 20 minutes. And the bell rings and oops, you're out of fucking time, kid. Now we have to go on with this matchup. Which is what I'm hoping. I wanted to see... A rematch in the future. Hopefully that is something we are going to see. But like I said, this whole Sean Spears scenario just threw everything for a loop. But uh, the interesting part about this matchup, Darby Allen brings a body bag with him to the ring. Cody Rhodes used it against him, stuffing Darby Allen in the body bag and then standing him up to deliver a, uh, what the hell does he call it? The flirting with disaster or whatever it is, the disaster kick. There it is. And then... Darby Allen did kick out after he took him out of the body bag. I just thought it was a very tremendous matchup. Darby Allen with some comebacks that just he just looked really, really good to me. I enjoyed this matchup and I hope to see big things from them in the future. And then we have Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks defeating the Laredo Kid and the Lucha Brothers. My favorite thing about this matchup was the gear that these guys came out wearing. Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks come out dressed up as Ryu, Ken, and Akuma, respectively, from the beloved Street Fighter franchise. And I thought that was kind of cool. They took it a whole nother step during the matchup where at one point all three of them would execute a Hadouken! on their opponents, and it was really, really cool. There was this weird moment at the start when Kenny Omega was going to make this entrance, this bullshit fan. I don't know why this was part of the entrance, but they had some guy who was pretending to be a fan run up the entranceway and then do the Batista. You know, when Batista comes out and he does the machine gun thing and the, the, I walk alone. And this guy comes up and he does that. And the lights go out, and the lights go back on, and this guy's laid out and Kenny Omega's standing there. Okay, I don't get it. So now these guys all go to the corners. You know, they're getting ready to have their tag team matchup. And then before the end of like the second minute of this, <laughs> everything just went wild. Just absolutely went wild. And I could barely make sense of half of the action. I couldn't see a lot of the stuff that was going on. But we've seen many Northern Lights suplexes. We see multiple super kicks, swantons, Canadian destroyers on multiple occasions. Like I said, it wasn't that this was a bad match. I'm not at all saying this was a bad match. Don't get me wrong. It's just I don't appreciate that style of wrestling for that long. If they would have cut the match time for this match, maybe to like two-thirds of actually what it was, we would have taken out a lot of those repetitive spots, and this matchup would have been at least like four or five stars to me. But that, I ain't Dave Meltzer. My stars don't fucking mean shit. I'm just saying, if you wanted to know where I'm gauging it at, it's definitely a four-star matchup. Not, not a five-star matchup, but I would have definitely put it much higher had they just reined in this just a little bit. Kenny Omega hits a Tiger Driver 98 to the Laredo Kid for a new for a two count. Omega multiple V triggers before finally pinning the Laredo Kid after hitting the one winged angel. This was a 20 minute long matchup of action, man. It was just high flying, Spanish flies, suicide dives, tope suicidas, all of the things you would expect, the Young Bucks' greatest hits, and with the talent in there that they were in, uh, that they were in the ring with tonight, it was just, it was a really entertaining 
matchup when all is said and done. My criticisms aside, not really trying to take anything away from these guys, but I'm just proving to you guys that nobody, not even Kenny Omega, is safe from the hammer. Then we had the John Moxley, Joey Janela, unsanctioned, lights out matchup. This was not anything near a wrestling match. This was just a straight up massacre of Joey Janela. He tried to do his best, but he was assaulted with barbed wire covered chairs. He was thrown in barbed wire covered tables twice. Death Valley drivers. All kinds was maybe the, the one wrestling move I saw Moxley deliver a Death Valley driver. But this was just, like I said, this was a, a hardcore match for the sake of having a hardcore match, and it meant nothing. It meant nothing. The crowd ate it up. I didn't so much. Two bags of, th- of thumbtacks emptied out into the ring for Joey Janela to go feet first into them and then back, you know, suplexed into them. Impaler DDT. Finally, this match would be over. If you like this, then fine. You know, then it's your style, and I'm glad you had a good time. Definitely, to me, was a waste of the first appearance of John Moxley. Overall, the best part about the Moxley match was how it ended, which was Kenny Omega coming out and assaulting John Moxley, meaning that we're going to get Moxley versus Omega, which means that we might see what John Moxley has in store when it actually comes time to wrestle. And if they just start booking him as a new Mick Foley, I'm definitely not interested. And it will all be for nothing. His big leap of faith, his big jump to the AEW will all be just a fucking titanic waste if all he wants to do is go over there and be this generation's Terry Funk. Or continue to pay homage to Mick Foley. Bring out the thumbtacks when you need the thumbtacks. Bust out the barbed wire when it makes sense for you to want to tear somebody's fucking face off. Why is he so mad at Joey Janela that he wants to tear his face off with barbed wire? Bob wire. <laughs> Bob wire. I think he lives down the street. Most of the t- that's it. Fuck Bob wire and fuck anybody that doesn't agree with me on this review. I, I you know what? You can say what you want about it. If you like, I said, if you enjoyed it, I'm glad you enjoyed it. If you hated the shit out of it. I could understand at some points why. But to be fair, this was a good show with some obvious mistakes. But it's going to get better. Is it the second coming of Christ as far as wrestling concerned? No! Not just yet. It may be. But everybody calm the hell down. This is just their second show. They're not saving the business just yet. And in fact, a few of the steps they took tonight maybe did a little bit of damage to the business as a whole. I will say before we get out of here that I did somewhat enjoy the commentary team tonight. I feel like they're starting to gel tonight. Last night, I feel like they're starting to gel a little bit better. I enjoyed the commentary and the banter between JR and the Golden Boy. I like Excalibur. I feel like the more these guys work together, the better it's going to get. And at times it was a little pausey, you know, a lot of space here and there, and sometimes talking over each other in in key moments. Uh, not that it was too distracting. I mean, it's JR, so I don't give a shit. Maybe he's the only one that, that's free from, from hammering because you got to love good old JR. And the commentary tonight was pretty spot on, and it was a hard night of action to call. I don't know how the hell they even got through that six-man match. I couldn't keep track of who the legal man was. I don't know if you could. I definitely couldn't. Ladies and gentlemen, those are my thoughts and opinions on AEW's Fighter Fest. I'm looking forward to Fight for the Fallen. All right, but this this video in particular, if it serves as proof of anything, it's proof to you guys that I ain't no AEW sweat hog. All right, I ain't sitting here jerking off to Cody Rhodes and, and thinking they're gonna save the fucking world. Do you know what I love? I love wrestling doesn't matter if it's AEW, House of Glory, WWE. And no matter what you put in front of me, if you put something in front of me that I'm not going to like, I'm going to come here to my show 
that you guys love and tell you about it. And I want to know how you felt about AEW's Friday Fest. Make sure you leave me some comments down in the comments section below. It's always my favorite part of the night is to read through what you guys are thinking and to see just how many of you agree with me and how many of you think I'm an absolute crazy moron. <laughs> Don't forget, if you are not already a member of the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show family, you might not want to join me if you're a big AEW guy following this one. But if you're still here after 40 minutes of me giving you my honest honest opinion of that show then you deserve to be a part of this family as well so make sure you hit that subscribe button and become one of the almost 1700 plus that know when you want your wrestling and entertainment news bullshit free this is the place to be and where are we we are right here at sledgehammer tv my name, ladies and gentlemen, is Nick Nightmare. This is the team, Thor the Sledgehammer, the official Sledgehammer of the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show, his tag team partner, the world heavyweight champion of all the microphones in all the world, Mr. Blue the Snowball. Don't forget to check out everything else we have put on the channel this week, from our 2K19 simulations to our Stomping Grounds review to our Raw and SmackDown hammerings, which is a weekly occurrence, and our big news as we talked about everything that might be wrong with the Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff move. What? Oh, you, you're not excited about that? Well, sure, I'm a, I'm a little excited, but I'm also a little bit of scared. So why don't you guys go check out that video and find out why that is right now. And don't forget to smash that like button if you enjoyed anything you've seen on this channel here today. Hit that like button everywhere you go. It does great wonders for the channel so that we can continue to grow as we would like to do. And I want to thank each and every one of you for being here with me as long as you have been over these last couple of years. Summertime is here, which means it's almost time to celebrate our anniversary. I'm looking for some cool things to do. Maybe you got an idea. Shoot it out at me in the comments below. That, my friends, is going to do it. And we are out of here. And we will see you next time right here on your new favorite wrestling show, The Sledgehammer Wrestling Show, only on Sledgehammer TV, right here on YouTube. Dot com. Hardcore wrestling without story means nothing.